Welcome, everybody. My name is Jay Tucker, and I'm the executive director for the Center for Management of Enterprise and Media Entertainment and Sports. That's the Center for Memes, which, by the way, is not the center for those social media jokes. Um, we do plenty at the center. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm here with you today is because we're going to talk a little bit about some of the summer programs that we offer to undergraduate students. Most of the courses that we offer throughout the year for MBAs, but in the summer, we offer our summer institutes, which allow students to learn about the business of sports and entertainment um, by taking two classes, uh, having capstone projects and other experiences that are really special. One of the things that I know students have been concerned about this summer is whether or not we're even offering the experience given the fact that everything at the university is going to be online. The good news is that we are and in order to give you a better sense of what it is that we'll be doing this summer, I'm pleased to have with me Molly Kinberg who is one of our instructors. Uh, she teaches our film and television class and she's a uh, really had a wonderful career here at UCLA and is a guru when it comes to media, distribution, the business of entertainment, et cetera. So Molly, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for um, having me and for that very lovely and gracious introduction. Ah, uh, it's, it was a very short introduction given all the stuff that you do. So um, hopefully we'll get into a little bit of that in a second. Sure. First, you know, film and television, uh, that's a big bucket of stuff. Right. Can you talk a little bit about more specifically what you cover in this class? Absolutely. So, um, you know, I think that this course is ideal for students with a passion or an interest in learning more about the entertainment industry today and the business behind it. Um, I specialize in very current um, industry developments and specifically international foreign growth. So the course will cover everything from, um, you know, what's been happening to the industry in the wake of COVID and how, um, what innovations are um, and opportunities are cropping up in response and reaction to a very new set of circumstances that we're all living through. Um, but we will cover everything from um, how to finance a film, both within the studio system, outside of the studio system. We'll learn about TV practices today and what's coming up tomorrow. We'll learn about streaming. We'll learn about production. We will learn about um, new technologies and personalization of content. Um, we'll learn the bare bones of what case studies are and how they work and um, give students opportunities to jump in and um, apply their own learning. Love it. Um, there's a lot there though. So we, the course is six weeks long. It sounds like what you're covering would normally take a year or two. Uh, how do you structure it? Um, well, I'm, I'm glad you asked, actually, because one of the ways um, I'll be structuring it is um, something that I've been learning on the ground, teaching this term at UCLA. So I teach typically out of the film and television program in the spring, um, which of course has gone online now in the wake of the pandemic, and have actually found it to be an incredibly, um, a surprisingly connective and dynamic forum for teaching. And part of the reason is that I've been able to deliver a lot more material in different ways. So there's gonna be a combination of synchronous learning in this class twice a week. So we'll be doing our one to four o'clock meetings unless you're in a different time zone, in which case it'll scale to whatever time zone you're in. But we'll also have a lot of what we call just in time learning opportunities. So it's materials that you can digest, whether it's um, recorded interviews that are of the moment, but um, talking to specialists and experts as we navigate and learn about each of the pieces. Um, we will have some written materials to work with. So uh, there's one book that I like to use for this, Sky Moore's The Biz, which I think is a great background backbone to understanding film financing. Um, we'll be looking at a lot of um, theme reports and paradigmatic reports that track um, film and television consumption. 
and um, then read a bunch of Harvard Business School case studies. And we'll do all of this in conjunction and combination with close work with guest speakers. Because really, one of the things that makes me most excited about getting to teach at Anderson and at the film division also at UCLA is the ability to be a gatekeeper really for the entertainment space because it, you know, this is, we're really in the land of um, entertainment and the ability to share that with students and bring the leading specialists into class to share their points of view, their points of entry into the business, but really what they've learned and what they discern coming, you know, on the horizon line of a few, you know, months, years, um, decades ahead is just a really um, exciting opportunity. Yeah, it sounds amazing. Uh, first question though, um, speaking about what's going on in the current business, it seems like um, this disruption for theatrical exhibition does have an impact on, you know, what gets greenlit and how much money people will be willing to invest in new content. You know, just from where you sit, do you have um, just a quick take on what you think the kind of next six months or next year is going to look like in the film business? Or is this good news? Should our students be scared? Well, I mean, I very thoughtful and great question. And I mean, it's been something that I've been chewing on sort of week to week in my class this term. And um, I mean, one thing we know for sure is going to change radically is windowing, right? The idea of when things come out and through the different modes of technology. So um, right now with theaters shuttered, it's causing, you know, it's costing huge sums for the studios, the producers, the makers film. I just was uh, watching a report this morning that said that um, I guess $2.4 billion of box office, it would have been domestic, just domestic generated dollars since the start of this are gone. And they're kind of gone, um, really gone, because that's not even, you know, when we can sort of reinsert and start putting it back into a release schedule, you're going to have so much crowding. Um, so I think that for the kinds of films that are not so excessively bulky in budget that you can release them, um, straight to streaming has been an option. I mean, obviously we saw Universals do that with the sequel to the, the Trolls movie. Right. Um, Disney Plus has been exploring that with some things. Where that doesn't work are the really big budget films. Like you cannot, Wonder Woman doesn't work. I mean, these films have been so reliant on trying to capture about 42% of their typical box office through theatrical that it is pushing towards a real revolution. I mean, it's interesting, the studies right now are indicative that given their choices, and we are creatures of habit and we are quickly adapting, um, the statistics keep on coming back saying that given their choice and the opportunity to simultaneously see something at home or in a theater, people are overwhelmingly, like 74% of people are saying they'd prefer to see at home. Um, mm -hmm. Not that, you know, and, and I think what this will do specific to film is going to put more, yet more pressure. Because I think with like all the noise from like alternate technology, there's already a lot of pressure on delivering what's like a truly theatrical experience, right? If you, people are gonna spend the money, because going to movies is really expensive. So people are going to go spend the money and go sit in a theater. It's got to be something that feels like it should be a movie experience, right? It should be a horror film. So when, you know, you see the tremendous success of like tr amazing films of that genre, whether it's Get Out or Us, um, but that's the kind of experience that's unique to, right? You want to sit in the dark. You want to go on that journey. You want to, that is, um, or, you know, whether it's an Avengers Endgame, that kind of an event. So I think that, um, it will even make starker that direction of um, studios wanting to make bets on what is uh, identifiable known uh, brand. I mean, obviously it's going to be a very long process to get back to where we can film. I mean, there are two right. films that have gone back into production in the last three weeks. One actually with sequestering in Australia. It's a cast with a lot of children. It's a horror film and they've so they've sequestered the kids, the chaperones, 
the cast, the crew, the catering, everybody's been together. That's a particularly tricky one because there are so many kids and they can only work 12 hour days. So, I mean, you have, uh, and then there's like a tiny film in Iceland that's gone back. But first, I mean, there'll, there'll be so many questions. I think that the overriding truth is that people want content. You know, we're all sitting here like so excited to see something new. So there's going to be all sorts of disruption, not just in the windowing, but in terms of identification around studios, right? And, and film festivals, like you now can is, you know, in, in the live variation of that, um, mm -hmm. doesn't have the glamor, the, um, the brand that you, you know, that gets, is so helpful in weeding out the great auteur film opportunities from the more commercial fair. So I think, I think that, you know, on the TV side, I think that we are probably witnessing the end of pilot season as we know it. Like, I do not think that that will come back as we've known it. I think that this is really mm -hmm. going to um, bring about a questioning and a querying of why we, what are the rituals and routines that we've had, whether it's the way we launch a film for awards, the way we connect with audiences. I think all of that is going to be reconsidered now in a way that I think for young people who are interested in learning about the business couldn't be a better time because you could really take a look and, you know, scratch your head and think, and, you know, we'll do a few classes about um, streaming landscape. So obviously, you know, Netflix, you know, it's reported to have made $20 billion last year, but also spent about 18 billion in original content last year. They actually have lost market share, fascinatingly, because of the growth of these new um, competitors. So you have Disney Plus in the mix, you have HBO Max. So there are all these new, you know, um, so getting to know that landscape and um, seeing how much you can cap out on, um, customers subscribe, you know, willing to subscribe and, and what is available where um, will be all, you know, interesting um, work for contemplation. And in this class, I plan to have students really be able to dig in, roll their sleeves up and make their own um, prognostication about what they think is coming. Love it. Now you mentioned also that um, you're excited to have guest presenters come in and that relationship, being able to connect essentially the industry to the students through people. Are there any guest presenters that you're particularly excited to uh, have this summer? So excited about um, a bunch of them coming in. Um, we're gonna kick off the course with um, a creative um, writer, director, producer, Simon Kinberg, who, um, has just written his first original since Mr. And Mrs. Smith and sold it to Netflix in this past month. But he's um, just wrapping up um, directing a film, 355, has directed uh, X-Men, but he's been writing and producing and directing film and television for years. And he will come in and um, speak with us, the first class, which will be great. Um, we will have... Um, Matt Broadley, who's a, a, a good friend and I, somebody who I think is one of the biggest experts in international markets, who was at Netflix branding the experience of what it was to watch. I mean, he was brought into Netflix four years ago in order to create the experience for viewers that, they, that the film quality could be as good as what you were going to see in movie theaters. So he, for instance, made Roma there um, with them. And that was, you know, he was really behind making that come. He also actually, another class, Jonathan King, who produced Roma will come in and talk. Jonathan has just left running um, film and television at um, Participant for the last many years and is starting now um, Concordia Film, which is a new social impact, um, company. So that we'll be talking to two partners from ICM to talk about the role, the, the rapidly changing role of the agencies in the wake of this, because, you know, as you know, um, the agencies have taken some of the hardest hit in this pandemic transition. So we'll be talking about their independent, their packaging division 
and um, their talent division. And um, my friend Scott Tenley and former colleague will come in and speak on behalf of MRC. He's the COO of MRC and also sits the head of Valence. Um, so we'll be talking about um, their work and recent successes like um, Knives Out and um, shows like Ozark and talk to them about next steps ahead. Um, Amy Israel, who's the EVP of at Showtime, um, will be talking to her about shows she's working on, um, how she looks, what she looks for in terms of identifying good television material. And um, who else? Oh, and one that I'm very excited about is Wes Harris, who's the head of marketing for YouTube Originals, who's going to be very hands-on in our capstone project. Ooh, nice transition. Well done. Because I was just about to ask you about your capstone project. One of the things that makes this whole experience unique is that for almost all of our classes, students have a chance to do a real project for an actual entertainment company. Um, it's one of the things that I think has set this experience apart from other classes students can take for years now. And you know, with your connections and insights and planning, I'm sure you've got something interesting cooked up. Could you just tease out a little bit about what uh, the plan is for Capstone Projects this summer? Sure. So the um, genesis of the idea for the Capstone Project this summer started to unfold during last summer's course when I brought the class into YouTube and we had this unbelievable presentation about the launch of Cobra Kai, which is their most successful um, series. And it's just, it, I mean, it was a fascinating talk that basically, I mean, if that data is power, then nobody sits on more data than Google and YouTube, right? They know what we want, what we're interested in, what we search. And it was all these fascinating silos of metrics of realizing that they had this huge base of people who were interested in karate, uh, karate kid, uh, Deadpool. I mean, there are all these funny metrics, male, 18 to 45, and basically they backed into, well, if this many people like Karate Kid, sort of backed into the concept of reuniting the cast, then they made a tremendously good show and killed it with the marketing. I mean, the marketing strategy was brilliant, but it sort of, it came together and it was the standout success in a sort of a, a turning point of contemplation for YouTube, which is, is their primary business and is the place they should be focusing their um, production efforts, should it be oriented towards original content or not? And if so, what should the length be? What should the format? Should it try to go toe to toe with other 30 minute um, shows, comedy shows? And, um, that is going to be, so to tease a bit, we're going to be really using that as a jumping off point for the students to roll their hands up and with repeated like encouragement and work with the folks at YouTube to really take a look at um, what are the opportunities ahead for YouTube? How does it best capitalize on its brand and what it does um, best? This is one of the things that I love about you and about your course, which is that you help kind of open up people's perspectives so that they can start thinking about the business, not just from the perspective of kind of how is the sausage made, but more to the point of how do you identify an opportunity? And when you've identified it, what do you do with it? Now, can you just talk just a little bit about your career and how you've gotten to the point where you can do that? Um, well, again, that's very kind praise um, from you. And it is true that this is really what I get um, excited about and most passionate about. Like I like sort of the problem solving components of with every door shutting, another one opens. And we are in a such a radical period of dynamic change that with all of the um, transitions, there's a lot of create space for creation. Um, and in terms of my path in, it was very peripatetic. You know, I um, graduated from college. I had gone to the University of Pennsylvania 
and I got a fellowship to go study in Cambridge where I did a PhD that was in literature. So I have three degrees in literature. I um, studied James Joyce and Virginia Woolf, came back to the US to finish the, the materials I needed to do the research were at a library back in New York. I finished from um, the States, got my degree, moved out to LA and was really trying to find a through line to um, how to bring my love of learning and my um, really profound interest in the world and in international markets and how you communicate and connect globally um, to a job in LA um, where I was living. And what I ended up doing was getting into the foreign film sales space, which is a means of financing film by pre-selling the foreign rights to independent distributors. And I did that. I ran, you know, a big um, film division at Senator, which became Mandate. We were selling a couple hundred millions of dollars of films a year. And then when they sold, were sold to Lionsgate, I decided to pivot and go to MRC, where I spent another eight years doing, you know, similarly helping um, finance and transition and I've been teaching at UCLA for about eight years as well and for me this is just um, a great connection of many things I love I mean I am truly a, a lifelong student so I love learning about making sure that what the students are learning is really current and relevant I love teaching and um, and I think that you know they're there really couldn't be a more interesting time to be examining all this stuff than today. That's right. I agree with you 100%. And I hope for those of you who are considering taking Molly's class that you are equally excited by the fact that we are living in interesting times when it comes to entertainment. Molly, thank you so much for the time. Uh, folks, I highly recommend film and television here at UCLA. Hope you enjoyed this segment and hope to see you in Molly's class. Thanks, Jay. See y'all soon.